All right, everybody. Well, welcome to the Stogie 411 show. Uh, we're starting right on time for once. Uh, and as you can see, Mike is over there, my partner in crime. He's on vacation, and his wife was nice enough to let him join us here. So uh, how's it going, buddy? Uh, it's going, cool, man. It's, uh, it's nice to be down here on vacation. It's, uh, it's a shame I have to leave soon to go back home. <laughs> yeah, I bet, I bet. Well, why don't you tell the fine folks who we got with us tonight, as they can probably see him sitting there already relaxing, and uh, let's kick this show off. Oh, everybody knows uh, Mr. Rocky Patel over there. Uh, he has been kind enough to lend us some time tonight to talk cigars and shop and all good things. So uh, welcome, Rocky. Uh, how are you doing this evening? Great, Michael. Great to be with you guys. Uh, happy to be here. My good old brother Nimish, uh, Nish and my cousin Nimish are pouring me a little Johnny Walker Black on the rocks and uh, I'm enjoying the Edge Maduro while I talk to you. Here comes my little cocktail. So uh, <laughs> welcome. Great to be with you guys. Well, thank you. We appreciate you taking the time out. And just so everybody knows, we do have a live chat room going, Rocky. So there will be some questions coming in for you through the chat room. Um, but just so everybody knows in the chat room, this will be a 45-minute show. Rocky was nice enough to take some time out for us this evening. He does have a prior commitment, and we want to respect that and let him go. So, Rocky, why don't we kick it off? Uh, I, I always kick it off and say tell people about yourself. But if if you're in the industry and you don't know who Rocky Patel is, I don't know what more you could tell them, but maybe there's something they don't know. So if you want to tell them, go ahead. Well, I mean, uh, you know, uh, I'm sure everyone knows I've been in the industry now about 16 years. I used to be an attorney and uh, spent a lot of time working in Honduras, Nicaragua, Dominican, and um, really learning the art of uh, making cigars, the curing, the fermentation, the farming, uh, the bunching, and finally, you know, the most important part, which is blending. And uh, I consider myself to have a very, very good palate because I used to be a chef and I enjoy cooking. And, you know, tasting cigars defines all those taste characteristics, taste characteristics that you're looking for when you're actually cooking. So I try to create blends that are unique, that are different, that are diverse, that have a lot of character, a lot of flavor. At the same time, I like them so that they're elegant, well-balanced. And we're always searching different parts of the world for unique types of tobacco, rare tobaccos. I know when we launched the Edge, uh, there's a particular filler that we have in the Edge cigar that I don't think anybody else in the world has. Uh, you know, I lie and I tell people it's Bangladesh. It's not Bangladesh, but that's the code word we use for it. So, uh, you know, we're, we're proud to make great quality cigars. We try to make cigars that are very unique in, in flavor profiles. At the same time, they have to be very consistent uh, and balanced. And every single cigar we make goes through a draw test machine, which I think is rare in the industry today. And for those of you that don't know, it's a specific machine that after the cigar is burnt, has a suction cup on it. It pulls and measures the amount of air flowing through it. If it's too loose or too tight, we don't even allow the wrapper to be put on cigars. So we're proud about making very, very good consistent cigars at a fair price. Yeah, that's good. Uh, and actually, the the Edge Maduro is, is I have to give a shout out to my brother in law. He absolutely loves the battalion, the Edge Maduro battalion. He he just smokes boxes of those things. It, it, it's and that's his go to cigar. It's just it's a really good smoking cigar. Yeah, well, the Edge Battalion, believe it or not, out of all the edges, is our number one selling size. Uh, I prefer smaller ranges personally, but. The Edge Battalion, the 6x60, has become our number one selling size in all the edges. And recently, you know, the Edge Maduro, obviously everyone's familiar with that, and the Edge Corojo. And then last year we introduced the Edge Sumatra, which has been a big hit, uh, which I love. It's got the little red foot band. And then this year at our trade show in Orlando, we released the Edge Habano. Uh, which is out of Nicaragua, and that cigar is going to be released in October, and that really is one of my new Edge favorites. So if you get the opportunity, please try it. I think you'll enjoy it very, very much. Not By the way, cheers, everybody. Cheers. 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 <laughs> cheers. I got my whole crew in the background here just so you know. We can hear them. We can hear them. It's nice to have a, a, a crew rooting for you. Hey, Rocky, well, you, we were just talking a little bit prior to the show, and we were talking about some of your new blends, and you had a few there in front of you. Why don't you tell the folks about what you got new, what's coming out? Well, brand new I have is our Freedom, okay? And this cigar is made out of our, our factory in Nicaragua and Esteli. Uh, we've been smoking it. We just got them in yesterday, and they're delicious. Uh, medium to full body smoke. 
uh, some spice to it, some sweetness to it. Uh, it's got a Habano wrapper from uh, uh, from uh, Nicaragua. I mean, from uh, Ecuador. And then it's got a lot of tobaccos from our farms in Nicaragua. We started farming a few years ago, and all that tobacco has come into fruition. So it's got a ton of flavor, really, really a neat cigar, and uh, a great value. And the cigar is called Freedom, to kind of, you know, based on the times we live in now where the FDA and everybody is regulating us, uh, you know, the cigar sells around $7. And um, it's, it's, it's going to be a wonderful cigar, and I think people are going to be proud. And, and this is something where we're trying to show that, you know, we have the freedom and the right to enjoy the fine things in life. So uh, hence we came out the name called Freedom. And uh, that, we just started shipping it today, so that should be out in the market in the next few days. You should find it at your local tobacconist. Great, great. And like you said, uh, the name fits appropriate. Like you said, the FDA always, you know, trying to take away everybody's hard work and right and uh, to smoke and enjoy a cigar as well as, you know, make it so if we want to go in and enjoy a cigar, we're not going to have a choice anymore. So, no, in fact, I was just in Washington, D.C. two weeks ago. Uh, I had a meeting with the FDA. We met with the FDA director and we met with about, I think, 14 policymakers and, uh, we were there and we, we talked to them. This is our second or third meeting, third meeting now with them uh, to try and get them to administratively exempt premium cigars. Uh, basically, the definition of a premium cigar is very, very broad under the TTB tax code right now. It includes products like Philly Blunts and Swisher Sweets and Blunt Wrap and all the stuff that they put marijuana in. Right. And they, they're after those products because of the youth access issues and the type of products they are. And we tried to show them that premium cigar is very different. It's not something people smoke as a habit. It. It's all made by hand. It's enjoyed just like a single malt glass of scotch or a glass of wine. By the time we plant a seedling in the ground, time to get a cigar in a box takes four to five years. So we've got the message through. We had a lot of medical testimony, which they didn't dispute, and they agreed with us that they want to protect our class, but they want to make sure that the rules are very, very stringent so we don't have any bad actors, so none of the machine-made companies can, you know, break the law and call themselves premium cigars. So I feel good. About the headway we're making please don't step make sure you join the CRA Cigar Rights of America that's CRA.org and it's uh, cigarrights.org a very very important organization that protects your rights and and we're trying to show the FDA that all the actual um, the, the the phone calls the emails the pressure that we've kept up is important and it's making a lot of headway so we're making headway there I feel comfortable we still have a long way to go we're also working on the legislative side. We've got a bill in Congress, H.R. 1639 and 1461 on the Senate side, which exempts premium cigars from FDA regulation. And just about five days ago, we got 220 co-sponsors. So now we have the majority on the House side. We've got about 14 senators on the Senate side, and there's bipartisan, uh, you know, participation on this bill. So we're hoping when something moves through the House or the Senate that we can actually get through some of this legislation. And I was at the Republican National Convention in Tampa. We met with many senators and congressmen there. We hosted a number of parties. We also, I was at the Democratic National Convention in the last few days, and we met with Senator Harry Reid, Senator uh, Manchin, Senator uh, Tester, Senator Casey, uh, we had Senator Menendez from New Jersey. So we're working on these people. We've got a lot of pressure on, and uh, you know they, they get the message, they understand the message, and it's just a lot of work and effort. And we, as consumers, all your fans out there, please participate, join Cigar Rights of America, because as a group, we need to be solidified to show that we're adults that enjoy the fine things in life, and it's a legal product that is a product that's an art form that everyone out there should have the freedom and right to enjoy. Couldn't say, couldn't very, say it any yep. better. <laughs> very, very well said. Um, now, a question from the chat room here a while. Uh, when you mentioned your uh, edge with the Edge Sumatra, now that was released before in a limited release. Was the release that you you just brought back out the same blend, or was was anything changed at it? No, it's the same blend. You know, initially we released small batches of it because we didn't have enough wrapper. Essentially, it's the same wrapper that's on the decade. 
and the cigar became so popular, it was eating into the wrapper quantity that we had available for the decade. So I couldn't make enough decade and make enough Ed Sumatra, so we focused on the decade. Now we finally acquired and fermented and aged a lot more the Sumatra wrapper from Ecuador, which is one of my favorite wrappers. So once we had enough wrapper, then we made it a full-time release on the Ed Sumatra. So the blend has not changed. It's been exactly the same. It's the same wrapper, the same filler. What people need to realize is sometimes, you know, we have the strictest quality control standards to make sure the blends are exactly the same. When you take a tobacco plant, it's typically divided into three sections, the top third being Liero, the heaviest tobacco, the middle third, Viso, medium body and texture, medium body and flavor, and the bottom third is Seiko, very thin tobacco, very mild tobacco. When you make blends, typically those factories use those three sections. What we do is I break the plant into more defined characteristics. So I call it priming. So when we start picking the tobacco, the first priming, second, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, all the way to the eighth priming. Eighth priming being the heaviest tobacco delivering the most flavor, and of course the fifth prime, or the first priming being the lightest. So when I make a blend, I'll say I want the eighth priming from a particular farm in Esteli, Nicaragua, the seventh priming from a particular farm in Hamastron, Honduras, sixth priming from a particular farm in Costa Rica. This way, every cigar has the same exact leaf from the same part of the plant with the same fermentation, it's the same curing, and the same fertilization to guarantee consistency. But what does happen is that you have crops sometimes where you get rainy season, dry season, or you get crops sometimes where the heat, the summer was way drier and the rain was a lot less. So Mother Nature controls sometimes the difference in the flavor profiles. It's not a science. You know, in wine, every vintage is different. Unfortunately, in the cigar industry, people expect that regardless of weather, every crop to be exactly the same. So you do have some inconsistencies sometimes in the flavor profile based on the weather. And what we do is try to adjust the primings to get it as close as possible. But of course, it's not perfection because it's not a widget and it's handmade. Right. Now, also on the edge line, I wanted to bring up here quick before, sorry, Mike, didn't want to cut you off. That's okay. Um, the Candela. You, you also had an edge candela. That's right. You know, everyone was laughing at me at the office, but I actually put a candela wrapper because there are people out there that like candelas. And I made an edge candela with the candela wrapper on it. It's the exact edge blend. We just put a candela wrapper on it. For those of you who don't know what a candela is, it's a wrapper that's not fermented all the way. It's not cured, actually, all the way. Uh, what you do is actually take the, the green leaf once it's harvested and really, instead of taking the time in the barn to slowly dry the humidity out of the leaf, you actually flash it with extreme heat and extreme humidity so the color and the chlorophyll locks in, but the tobacco is cured and it gives a different taste profile to the flavor and the look and the wrapper is actually green when you put it on and so we put that on the edge it tasted very unique very different and that's been a home run for us and we didn't make that many boxes and we released them and we're back ordered on them right now but we're in the process of making many more well nice rocky uh, another question from the chat room you're always on the road you're always going to events do you find that find that these events are really key to your business well, I think, you know, from day one, my message has been I burnt a lot of shoe leather to go out there and expose the product. There's nothing better than meeting the consumers and talking to them and seeing what they want to smoke, getting the feedback from them of what they think about the cigars, educating them. I always give them a lesson about how the farming process is, the curing process, the bunching process, the draw testing process, the quality control standards we employ. We take about 2,000 people a year down to Honduras to our factories, not just to have fun, but to show them that this is an art form. It's a labor of love, how much work goes into making a, a quality cigar. And the strict quality control standards that we employ at our factories and we do this to show them how hard it is to make a great quality cigar in the same way I go to the stores to show them the labor of love you know what it takes to make a blend what the profiles are answer questions speak with them and build relationships and really this is about doesn't matter if you're a blue-collar worker or CEO or an athlete when you're at a store we're all equal when we have a cigar it cuts across all religions all races and that's the beauty of it and I enjoy going out there and meeting people and working hard and talking to them about the passion and the love for cigars that we have and what we what we do to make them now uh, John G had a question here also along the lines with your quality control. He was saying, uh, he asked, he goes, you have so many great lines. How do you handle quality control with that type of scale? Well, you know, the, the key here is it all starts with the curing and the fermentation. 
and we don't ever release any line till we have an abundance of all the different tobaccos required for a particular line. So for example, when we release Freedom, there's about four or five different tobaccos in the Freedom blend. So wrapper, binder, and all the fillers, we make sure we have enough of the wrapper, binder, and filler that is well-aged, well-fermented for a long time before we even release a blend. So for example, I may make a blend now that I'm gonna release three years down the line because we have a little of that tobacco and we've come up with the right taste profile, but then we'll collect that tobacco over the time, age it, cure it, ferment it, till it's absolutely perfect. So in every single line that we make, we make sure we acquire an abundance of tobacco. At any time, we're sitting on $18 million of just Lijero and wrapper. Okay, that's just two leaves. So we sit on a lot of inventory of quality, quality tobacco that either we grow or we buy from others. And until that's perfect, we don't release that line. And then, of course, we have very strict quality control standards that never change at the factory. You know, starting with the bunchers, they're limited to making 250 cigars per pair a day, while most factories make 500 per pair a day. We have every cigar, you know, they take all 50 cigars, they weigh them, make sure they fall within three grams of each other. Every single cigar is draw tested. They check the head, they check the cap, they check the ring gauge. And this is all just purely construction. So in every level, there's strict quality control standards. This is before they go into the aging room. In the aging room, they're there for six months, then they check the color. I have very strict standards in the color that I want because if you go to a retail store and buy five cigars and the retailer opens a new box and fills it up and the color is different, that would be a problem for me. So I have a very strict, being mother nature, you get all different colors in a particular wrapper, but I want a similar color in a very narrow range of what it should look like. So the cigars that are perfect in construction, but are just a little lighter or darker than the range I've set, they become factory selects. The cigars that have a few blemishes on it, or you see some veins on it, they become seconds. Again, perfect to smoke, there's nothing wrong with them. You couldn't tell the difference if you lit one up, but again, those are the strict quality control standards we set. So in every line we release, even though we make a lot of cigars, our standards never change, and we make sure we have adequate amounts of right tobacco in order to sustain the line. If, for example, one, and what's happened before in decade, one particular leaf needs more curing, more fermentation, we'll stop the actual rolling process for four months, three months, five months, whatever it takes till we have the perfect tobaccos for each of our lines. Nice. That- there you go, John G. That was, that was excellent. I mean, that, that, that really explained the whole process throughout there. And I hope, uh, I hope he was listening and I hope he learned something. I did. Yeah, definitely. Me, me as well. I had a feeling it was going to be a learning show, but, uh, speaking of the decade, it's one of my, one of my favorite cigars of yours. And I love, I love the box. There's just something about that box that I love. Well, there's an interesting story to that box. You know, I wanted to create a rustic box that is really old, kind of reminded you of something beat up, vintage, authentic. And I actually took a box from one of the box factories, tied a chain to the back of the car, hooked up the box to the back of the car, and we drug it through the streets of Esteli for about 24 hours, literally tied the box just like you do when you tie your beer cans on the back of a wedding, somebody's getting married. In the back, we literally for 24 hours drove around the streets of Esteli in the mud and the stone, in the water and everything to give it that antique look. And I brought that back box back to the box factory and said, okay, I want you to replicate this. And they looked at me like I was nuts. <laughs> they took chains and they're beating the box with chains and beating it with all kinds of stuff, throwing it around. They said, it'll take us forever to make these boxes. We can't do that. So ultimately what we did is we came up with this look where we took a box and actually just took a bunch of sawdust and blew the sawdust on it and glued it on the box and then we came up with all those cool graphics and those graphics were made in Amsterdam, Holland by a good artist who just took all the different processes that you know you go through from the farming to the curing to the barn to the fermentation to the rolling parlor to the leaf selection and all those graphics are illustrated in the box. So that's how the history of that box came along. Yeah, it's a, it's a great box. I, I really... I, I'm one of those guys who I look at a cigar, I look at a box kind of like my dinner. I enjoy the band. I look at the band. A lot of time has gone into that. I look at the boxes and stuff like that. I really, I really enjoy looking at. And there's oh, a, cool. there's got a some... little selection. We got the uh, Ocean Club, which I, I absolutely love in the 60 size. Your uh, Connecticut. 
which is good, I think, at any size, really. I, I enjoy the Connecticut all, all, all over. And the 50, which I love the Toro size in, the, in your 50. Yeah, the 50 is actually my favorite cigar. And obviously, for those of you that don't know, I turned 50 years old, and that celebrates that cigar. And that's a nice, rich, full-bodied cigar, one of the fullest-bodied cigars we've made. And that comes, you know, we made about 2,000 boxes of each size in that. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a, it's, it happens to be one of my favorites, and I love it. And it's just rich and decadent and lots of flavor. And if you get the opportunity to get one, because we only made 2,000 boxes in each size, and once they're gone, they're gone. And those boxes are amazing. There's 550 Swiss crystals on each box. And then we have a cigar coming out at the trade show that we released called Rocky Patel Private Cellar. And that cigar won't be released till October. And that cigar is going to blow you away. It happened to be our number one selling cigar at the trade show. And uh, it, it, it's another full-bodied, rich cigar with a ton of spice, nuttiness, caramelliness, uh, just a beautiful, beautiful smoke. Uh, and people are going to love that cigar. Um, it's got a kind of a purple band on it, and uh, it's got the look of the vintage boxes, but uh, the, the cigar is absolutely awesome. So try the Freedom, try the uh, Private Cellar. That's the cigar I've been smoking as my personal cigar for the last three years, and we just didn't have enough of the right tobaccos uh, to, to release it three years ago. And finally, we've been accumulating and getting the tobaccos, and people are going to love that cigar. Nice. Now, with your company being so huge now, uh, with, with so many different lines, you know, so many different blends, what's the hardest thing you find, uh, other than acquiring the tobacco itself, what, what do you find is the hardest aspect of running such a, a huge corporation like you have with all the, the individual blends, you know, for the cigars? Well, you know, the, the thing for me that's very difficult is I love blending. And anytime I release a cigar, I'll make 150 to 175 blends before I choose one. And then when I choose that blend, I'll tweak it and I'll change it and tweak it and, you know, change the binder, maybe change each filler, change half a filler, and ultimately come up with something perfect. And the hardest part is getting the tobaccos and getting enough of those good tobaccos and consistently the same tobaccos so it doesn't change. Because it's easy to find tobacco, but it's hard to find great tobacco. And it's hard to find great tobacco so that you can launch a line in a big way. Small batch is easy. Anybody can make small batches and make it, you know, and that's what I do when we smoke around the office and make stuff for ourselves. But to make enough of it and consistently get the same tobaccos is very, very difficult. The other thing uh, that's the hardest thing for me is that people want me at events all over the country, and there's only one, you know, I'm one person. And every, somebody, everyone's got a 10th anniversary party or this party or that show and that show. And I try to try to oblige everybody, but I can only be at so many places, you know, and I've only got 360 some days in a year. I can only accommodate so many people without having a life. And, uh, and on top of it, you know, I spend about 30% of my time in Washington, D.C., fighting all the FDA regulation. So it, that takes up a lot of my time. So the... I hate saying no to people, and that's a difficult, difficult task for me. But the hardest part is getting to everyone and getting out there to please everybody. Right. Well, I don't know how you do it. I don't know how you can remember every cigar that you have, the name. I mean, I, I got six kids, and I sometimes forget their names. So I don't know how the hell you do it with all the lines you have. But God bless you for that. <laughs> Yeah, I don't have any kids, but I guarantee you each one of those cigars is like my personal kid. <laughs> there, there you go. There you go. Well, let's see. I, I'm looking up here, Rocky, so you know I'm not ignoring you. I'm looking up here in the chat room. I got a whole bunch of monitors going. But let's take another question from the, the chat room, Rocky. They said, uh, Rocky being in this business so long, and he's been, uh, how do you, he feels being that IC, ICPCPR and RTDA show has the same is, impact as it used to? I believe so. I mean, you know, for those of you that don't know, that's our trade show where all the retailers from around the world come and they get to look at our cigars. They get to see all the old blends we have, the new blends we have, and they actually buy cigars and they visit us and we have booths there. And it's a four-day show. 
uh, very, very busy. And uh, we just had our last show in Orlando. Next year, it's going to be in Las Vegas. And uh, the show is still a solid show. Uh, you know, we still have great attendance there. The people that show up there are serious tobacconists who care about the art of making cigars. They care about selling great quality cigars. So that show has a great impact and is a great show for the business. There you go. Now, uh, I wanted to bring up uh, Nish Timish. You brought into the fold uh, right with there. your company. Timish. Get back Come on, here. step around. And, uh, He's, he's sipping away in his scotch back here. We'll bring him here. We'll let him answer this question. How are you guys doing? Hey, Nish. Hey, What's hey, going on? Well, Cheers. We Cheers. See, with, with you bringing them into the fold with Rocky Patel, did you help them with the blending process? Did you lend any of your expertise, or did you let them go and find out on their own as they were exploring to, to make a cigar? This well, you know, they, they, they spend a lot of time with me at the factories in Honduras and Nicaragua. And, you know, typically when I make blends, I make them myself. And then when I like something, I'll give it to them and we'll come down to four or five blends and they'll, they'll kind of lend their expertise and opinions. And they've spent enough time at the factories where Nimish is down there taking the groups down all the time. I used to take the groups down myself all the time, and I just didn't have enough time. So he spends a lot of time in Honduras taking groups down, educating them. He's down there taking care of the quality control. He spends more time at the factory now than I do. So obviously he's learned a lot about the tobaccos. He's learned a lot about blending. He's learned a lot about the whole process. So I just let him loose and said, I want you to create your own cigar. And I did the same thing with my brother. So Nimish released Thunder which was made out of a factory in Nicaragua. And then my brother Nish decided that he wanted to make the first box press Connecticut called Zen. And he wanted to make Connecticut, we say Connecticut with an attitude, because this Connecticut actually has a lot of flavor. Most Connecticut's are just mild, but this has a lot of spice, pepper, and a lot of flavor and character. So I let them loose and they created them the, the cigar blends themselves. Nice, and I, I actually had some Zens, I stopped at a uh, Gary Griffith's shop on the way down through. Yeah, it's a great and, shop. Guy. Yeah, and and I, I grabbed some and I smoked the last one this morning. I I, I love that cigar too. I mean, I, I think that's a that's a really good blend. Yeah, that's a great cigar. And um, my brother Nish, he's here too. And oh, uh, hey, come on here, Nish. Come and make an appearance. You know. <laughs> Don't be and, fast uh, food. Yeah, he created the Zen. And uh, guy. there he is. How's it going? Hey, Nish. I know we did that on the cell phone because I wasn't up to date with Skype. That's okay. Hey, it was a good show, and we appreciate it. You got it. Cheers. Cheers to you, my man. Thank you. I'm smoking on New Edge. There you go. Oh, nice. You guys are getting all the benefits. Speaking of new, Rocky, uh, let's talk a little bit about the burn. Yeah, I got the burn right here. For those of you that don't know, we opened up a really, really cool cigar lounge in Naples, Florida called Burn. If you've never had the opportunity... Please come. It's like no other cigar lounge in the world. I promise you, you're going to be blown away uh, by the experience there, the decor there, the charm, the music, the whole experience. It's like nothing ever you've seen before. And, of course, the ladies. And, uh, you know, we, we came up with the Burn Cigar that we launched just for Burn and all the Rocky Patel lounges. And now we're doing a national launch with a different Burn Cigar called Burn. And the footband says Naples, Florida. And this is a complete Honduran Puro. And it's got a lot of flavor, but it's got a ton of sweetness. I've never smoked a natural cigar like this with that much sweetness in it. And that cigar is going to be hitting the streets probably in about a month and a half. Oh, we released a little, well, we released some, but they've been sold out and we're back ordered on it. So uh, we're, we're rolling some, but they're just sitting in the aging humidors now. And it's going to be about mid-October to late October before the next batch arrives. And if you can get a, hand, a hold of some of the burn cigars, it, it, it's got a lot of body but a ton of sweetness. Very unique for Honduran Puro. Nice. Look forward. That Hamastron tobacco from Hamastron has a ton of sweetness to it. And that's what a lot of the body of the cigar is. And I think you'll, you'll love it when you get it. Nice. Well, Rocky, let's take another question. Fuser in the chat room wants to know, how do you recommend developing your palate? Well, the best thing you can do is start smoking cigars. First, I obviously recommend starting with some milder cigars, especially if you're smoking in the mornings, in the daytime. After you have a meal, then I recommend going to something a little 
medium bodied, a little heavier, and certainly at night, if you have, like, if you enjoy a great cab or a nice single malt scotch and a big steak or something like that, then try that full bodied cigar. And it's going to give you a lot more pepper, a lot more spice, a lot more richness. And it's about experience. You know, you have to try not only Rocky Patel cigars, but all cigars and really have a diversity of palate. I personally, obviously smoke a lot of my cigars, but I also smoke other cigars from other manufacturers because there are other people who make great cigars out there and I want to experience the taste profile. And if I just only smoke my cigars, I get bored of smoking the same stuff over and over. It's like a restaurant. You don't go to the same restaurant all the time. And so I recommend trying as much as possible. You will know immediately what you like. And certainly there are very good cigars and bad cigars out there. And your palate has to filter that. And it's something you can't teach overnight. It's just about practice and trying and experiencing. And when you smoke the cigar, let your mental, let your mind and your palate just go and think about all the different spices. Think about all the different things that affect you in life that you actually take in. And when people say lead and meat and like all the cigar aficionado notes, no, just pay attention to what kind of characteristics your own senses bring to your palate. Think about whether it's cinnamon, whether it's caramel, whether it's nutty. It might be nothing. It might just be a flavor profile that you like, you know. And your mouth has about 15 senses, but your nose, when you release the smoke through your nose, has about 53 senses. That's why when you get a glass of wine, it's big for a great wine because it's all in the nose. You smell it. The taste in your mouth is it's just a small percentage, but when you release it through the nose, you get a lot more flavor, a lot more character, and it's slowly working up to that process. Well put. Man, I'm telling you, your answers have been great, Rocky, really. We really appreciate it. I mean, you've been very informative to everybody in the chat room and everybody's watching live, and uh, just really informative. Appreciate it. Thank you. It's my pleasure. Well, and now this is the question. I was going to ask you this question, too. Uh, Matt actually brought it up in the chat. He said, what is your favorite cigar other than one of your own? Thunder. Well, I didn't name it Thunder. <laughs> Um, well, I mean, there's a few that I like a lot. You know, I like the La Flor Dominicana Double Ligero. Uh, I lean towards fuller bodied cigars. I think that's a great cigar. I think the Padron Anniversario is a very, very good cigar. Um, so, you know, there, there's a number of other cigars out there that I've tasted that are very, very good. But those two come to my mind right away. Uh, of course, the Padron's pricey. Uh, you know, the La Flor. Double Lee Hero, I think, is a very nice peppery cigar with a ton of flavor. Uh, I had the Nesta Miranda Lancero, uh, which I think also is a very, very nice cigar and has a lot of flavor. Um, but um, there's, there's, there's about a handful of cigars. I mean, I'm picky. There's not a lot of cigars I like. There's very few cigars that I just fall in love with, but those certainly are some of them. Out of your line, Rocky, and I know it's hard to say, is there anyone that really is close to you is a cigar that you sit there and you go, wow, I'm really extremely proud of it. Not that you're not proud of all of them, but is there one that just stands out to you? Well, I have three favorites, and it would be the Rocky Patel 50, uh, which you're holding in your hand, Michael. Uh, I love the decade, and I love the 15th anniversary. So the 15th anniversary, I'd say after the 50, it's probably the 15th anniversary, and then the decade. Those are my three favorites. Great cigar. There you go. Great cigar. Foot band. That's it. It is. It's really a nice uh, smoking cigar, and I'm not a. I'm more of a mild to medium smoker most of the time, anyway. But uh, that cigar really has so much flavor to it. I think that it, it's it's really nice. Uh, again, it, I will say uh, it's a little pricey, you know, for some people to handle. Yeah, but nice. you know, if you have extra extra cash laying around, something special. Yeah. Maybe it's somebody's 50th birthday, and it would, it would fit perfect, you know? And the Decade and the 15th aren't as pricey, and those are great. Now, another cigar, if you like something mild to medium, and this cigar is absolutely on fire for us, is the Vintage 2003 Cameroon. That cigar, yeah. I mean, it took us seven years to collect this Cameroon wrapper because Cameroon wrapper is really hard to get because it comes in very small sizes and the wrapper is usually very spotty. And it took us seven years to collect enough good Cameroon wrapper to launch this line. And the Vintage 2003 is just absolutely delicious because it's got that sweetness from the Cameroon. It has a lot of balance and a lot of flavor. 
Yes, I like the Cameroon. I, I really like that. Well, let's see, Rocky. Here's a good question we, we like to, to ask on our show. One of the viewers uh, want us to ask about Cuba, the embargo. If it's lifted, if and when, how do you think it's going to affect the industry? And personally, uh, how do you feel about it? Well, my take on Cuba at present is the following. They used to make great cigars 30 years ago. But the problem with Cuba is they keep growing tobacco in the same soil. They don't have money for fertilizer. The soil is completely deleted, depleted. The second problem is they rush the whole process of making the cigars. They make them so fast that they don't, because they need the foreign currency, they need the exchange, that the tobacco is not fermented enough. You smoke the cigars halfway through, they get sour, bitter, you get that ammonia taste. Half of them you can't draw on, yep. they're plugged. The fakes are better than the real ones sometimes. And so we don't worry about the Cuban cigars so much in the international market. It's very, very hard to pierce that market because Cuba, Cuba, Cuba. Now we're finally gaining a lot of momentum. People in Europe realize that better cigars are coming out of Nicaragua and Honduras than the Cubans. So. There's no doubt in my mind that Cuban tobacco is unique and distinct in flavor and would be great to blend with. To make a Cuban cigar with all Cuban tobacco would be very linear. So we would be excited to have the opportunity to have great Cuban tobacco to blend with. It would take us almost two to three years to get the farms back to where they need to be, to retrain the people in making the right bunching, make the cigars the proper way. And believe it or not, we're ready. We work very closely with the Nestor Placencia family, who is the biggest grower of Cuban seed tobacco in the world. They're our partners in a lot of things that we work on. Hence, I have the opportunity right now to have all that great tobacco that I was talking about earlier in the show, to have a lot of it because they are the principal growers of Cuban seed tobacco and we get the first right of all their great tobacco that they actually farm. So they're already been to Cuba, they're ready, they have relatives there. When Cuba opens up, we'll be one of the first ones to be in Cuba if the government allows people to actually have tobacco and make cigars in Cuba or take that tobacco out of Cuba and be able to make it out of Honduras and Nicaragua. That's where I see the, the real benefit of Cuban tobacco is the fact if someone like yourself could get your hands on the tobacco itself and blend it with what you're doing now or even with something new, you know, like you said, using all Cuban tobacco nowadays, just it, it's really not that thrilling, I, I don't think, to the palate to, to really anything. Quality control is going downhill just tremendously, you know, with, with their cigars. But I think the, the real benefit would be, you know, someone like yourself or, you know, like you said, Nestor Placentia, you know, any any of the the big guys in the industry get a hold of this Cuban tobacco and start making blends that include it. I think, like you said, it would add that unique flavor to a cigar coming out of Honduras, Nicaragua, Dominican Republic, and I, I really think it would uh, change the, the the industry at least for a little bit. You know, uh, until people got tired of that too. People are really fickle here, Dave. <laughs> No, I completely agree with you. I mean, that tobacco is almost dead. And uh, and when I say dead, I don't mean dead, dead. But I mean, the, the flavor that you can actually get from a great Cuban tobacco, if it's fermented properly, grown properly, farmed properly, would be interesting to blend with and it would be really fun. So when that day arrives, you know, we'll all be ready. And, uh, you know, I'm sure so will all our competitors. And uh, it'll be fun for the entire industry. Yeah. Now I guess uh, we're getting here close to the to the time here. Yep. So oh, first off, carry, we can carry on till eight. I'm having fun. I still have a cocktail, so let's go. <laughs> <laughs> All right, nice. All right, bingo. All right. <laughs> All right. Well, um, I, I I have to say, I, there's somebody in the chat room, and I, I have to bring this up. I, I don't want to give free advertising out here or anything. Well, but just don't mention the name. Think, yeah, they're they're saying that they're going. They don't know if you know or not that your cigars are going to be featured in an upcoming music video and photo spread by a Philadelphia performing artist. How do you feel about that type of cross-branding? Oh, I didn't even know about this. Who is this artist? Uh, Realism. R-E-A-L-Y-S-M. I will say, Rocky, this is the first time this person's been in our chat room, so we can't verify anything. Well, I mean, listen, any any type of publicity that portrays our cigars in a good light is a good thing. You know, as long as 
we we like to share cigars with anybody that enjoys the fine things in life, that appreciates the amount of work that goes into making a great quality cigars. They appreciate the art form. They have a palate. We're more than happy as long as the entire industry is promoted in a good light. Because really, this is a culture. This is not something that we. This is not cigarettes. This is not something that's habit forming. This is enjoyed by adults and. I think all of us together are proud of the fact that we enjoy a good cigar. We enjoy the fine things of life. We were able to communicate like we do today. We're able to share with our friends. I mean, the day of Facebook and Twitter, when nobody has a conversation besides on a computer, when you can actually sit down face to face and talk about life and sports and politics, I mean, it's a beautiful, beautiful product that you can actually take the time in our busy lives and relax, and you can actually just dream, or you can sit with some fellow friends and make a new friend, you know, just with one cigar. I mean, I'm on an airplane and I sit some, next to somebody, and if I talk about a cigar and they smoke a cigar, you've got a friend for life. It's amazing. And the bond of the cigar is way beyond anything that has happened in this world. It's, it's, it's built a relationship amongst all of us that is something that you can't breach. And that's the beauty about this product. Absolutely. Now, I will say that he says on here, the realism says that they, they've been in talks with your marketing department about brand partnership. So I just want to throw that in. That's wow, that's quite interesting. Maybe uh, it's something I'm not aware of. I've been out of town for quite a while. and <laughs> My sister-in-law handles a lot of that, and I'll have to talk to her about it. But I, I do want to tell you, if you guys are in New York, or if any of your consumers uh, are listening to this show, we are throwing the biggest cigar party that's ever been thrown in New York next week on Thursday. It's called, it's at Cigar Square, uh, Studio, Square. Studio Square. I think it's in Estonia? Or it's in Estonia. It's in Estonia. It is going to be about 2,500 people. Uh, it's close to Queens. And we're throwing this incredible party from 4.30, 5.30 to 7.30, or uh, whatever, five, back chatter here, 5.30 <laughs> to 8.30. And uh, it, it, it's, it, it's, I mean, it's all the top liquor companies. I know there's going to be a lot of hockey players there, New York Yankees, I mean, a lot of celebrities. Um, they have a massive stage. It's one of the biggest screens that they have on there. They have live bands. Uh, the probably some of the best steak you've ever eaten in your life. Incredible kitchen and uh, a ton of girls from Hustler and Pan Out. It's just a big adult form of fun. And it, this place is mind blowing. Uh, when my brother told me about it, I didn't believe it till I saw the pictures and I met these guys. And I took the guys from cigar. My brother took the guys from Cigar Aficionado there for dinner, and they were absolutely blown away uh, with the food, the decor, the place. They're even thinking about possibly having the big smoke in New York there next year. So this Thursday at Studio Square, if you get the opportunity, come there, and we'll be there from 5:30 to 8:30, and it's going to be one heck of a party. I think it's like 220. dollars a person, and if you get more than 10, 10 cigars, beautiful carrying pouch. You get 10 cigars, uh, it's in a gorgeous gift case. You get free dinner, all the drinks you can have, and it's going to be pretty amazing. Wow. And uh, we've made a special sample pack of 10 cigars just for this event, but just the food and drinks alone is going to be worth it, along with the entertainment. Plus, you get an ostrich pouch and you get all kinds of stuff. It, it's it's going to be an amazing event. Nice. Well, wow, that sounds nice yeah. for people up there in New York. Hopefully, hopefully you get a big turnout. Yeah, Mike, come on, drive down. It's not going to be that far. It's not. You're have some fun. It's about four and a half hours. It's not that far. It's not bad. No, it's you can crash in my room. No, all right, <laughs> the, the, the invite's on. That's Look at that game right after. I, I, that. I don't know about that, Rocky, but the chat room just went crazy after you said that. <laughs> <laughs> Well, let's see, Rocky. Uh, oh, first of all, G. Bonnie says hi to you, Rocky, if you know who G. Bonnie is. G. Bonnie? Yeah, G. Bonnie. Yeah, it says hi no, to you. G. Bonnie. G. Bonnie. G. Bonnie. Know, Anyways, but uh, there's, a, there's a good question in the chat room. Has there been a cigar that you made that has surprised you? Well, certainly the Edge Candela was one. Uh, but uh, I would say the original Edge. Uh, you know, when I released that, Everyone thought I was crazy because it came out of a count box. And I wanted to make something that was really factory original, that looked like it's not about the flash of the box. It's not about anything else besides the basic cigar. When I smoked that cigar, I knew it was a home run. And I used tobacco. 50% of the tobacco in that cigar is tobacco that nobody's ever used, ever, 
ever. It's from a country I can't mention, but it's a country you'd never think tobacco comes from this country. And everyone said, you're nuts, you're crazy. And I smoked it and I said, this is amazing. And, and we priced it, uh, I think it was $5 a cigar at the time we released it. And that cigar just took off like, so Edge would have to be that cigar that totally blew me away and surprised me. I knew it was good. I loved it. I thought it was amazing. But the way it took off and the way people adored that cigar, so I would say that would that would be the one cigar that actually blew me away. Nice. All right. Oh, Rocky, FYI, G. Bonnie is Gary from Garvino's. Oh, yeah. Oh. Hi, Gary. How are you, buddy? Uh, he can hear you as well, just so you know. And your wife out there. They have a wonderful store out there in Florida, and uh, they're kind of... It's a hard place to describe. It's uh, it's in Central Florida, kind of uh, between Tampa and Orlando, a little bit further south. But it's a real interesting store because the only way everybody in that whole town is a golf course community. You ride around in golf carts, and all the parking spaces are not for cars; they're for golf carts. And these golf carts are all souped up to look like Rolls Royces and Bentleys, and and everyone drives around. And he's got a beautiful store, and he's got a wine bar right next to it. He has live music. Uh, they're great people. Nice to see you guys, and if you get a chance, visit their store. It's awesome. Yeah, he said he saw it on Facebook, and we appreciate you stopping in, Gary. Thanks so much. Uh, Mike, you want to take what Realism said? He apparently is going to be at your event, Rocky. Yeah, yeah. yeah he, he said he's going to be in attendance in New York to meet you in person. So awesome. I'll look forward to it. And you'll get to say, so you talk to my marketing department? <laughs> 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 so what's the story? That's what's going to happen. <laughs> now, uh, Rocky, with, with your cigars, with uh, uh, the wrappers, the binders, everything that you use, do you find it hard nowadays to come up with something new and different than what's already out there in the industry? Because, I mean, there are, there are a lot of cigars out there right now. Uh, well, I mean, it, it's, it's a good, good time for cigar smokers, but... Well, there's no doubt that there's better cigars at a better price with better quality than ever in history before. Right now, we have some amazing cigars out in the marketplace. So it is a big challenge to come up with something that is different, unique, different taste profile. And so I'm always searching around the world to try to get tobaccos from unique places that people have never used before. We're working on a project right now that I can't talk about in a country that tobacco, again, has never been grown. And it's a research project. We're growing there. We set up barns there. And we're going to work on it. We had a small batch production made, and it was amazing. So now we're taking it to another level. So there's a lot of risk involved. I mean, I like to take that risk to try and conquer new boundaries and to try and come up with stuff that is unique and different. And that's something that we're always working for. And you have to take the risks and you have to take the challenges to work on it. Otherwise, it's the same old stuff if you're just going to be cookie cutter. Exactly. <clears throat> well, Rocky, let's take the, the other go thing. Ahead, Mike. Sorry. Oh, go ahead. Mike. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. No, I, w I wanted to ask you, and uh, I, I don't want to, I don't want to sound like an ass asking, but um, well, you're not proposing, are asking, you? <laughs> I'll just make sure you're not proposing. That's all. <laughs> no, 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 no. No, you're gonna, you're gonna share his room. I, I'm not proposing. It's all right. <laughs> but no, I wanted to ask. Now, you know, uh, Rocky, you, you've been around long enough where you hear the bad press, you hear the good press, you you hear the awful things, the good things, you know, about yourself. And, and because you're one of the biggest in the industry, a lot of it gets directed towards people like yourself or uh, Kaizad, uh, uh, Gurkha, you know, is another one that, that we can mention. How hard is it for you to separate, you know, basically, some people who are just idiots who, who really don't know what they're talking about other people are trying to give uh, constructive criticism to help you or uh, give information that, that you might not know otherwise. How hard is it for you with being, being rocky? Well, I mean, it's rare that I get a lot of, you know, personal offensive comments or anything like that. And um, I'll tell you that I'm computer, absolutely computer illiterate. <laughs> Uh, that's why I had to have Patrick have set up this whole Skype thing. <laughs> they got me a laptop two years ago. I've opened it once. Um, I'm old school. I grew up on MS-DOS, C drive, 
And, uh, you know, I just pencil and paper guy. I concentrate on the factories and working and being on the streets. I'm not that I've never gotten on the blogs. I wouldn't know how to get on a blog. They got me tweeting a little bit here and there, and I tried that for a couple of weeks. And, you know, I've never been on Facebook, don't know how to use Facebook. Uh, we have people in our office that do that. Yes, I would like to have the personal touch and be honest and answer questions. Uh, but, you know, I've never gotten involved in all that stuff and the banter. And there are a lot of people on a lot of the sites who just have their personal opinions, who really don't understand tobacco, don't know the work we put into it, are not there with us, they don't see, and they're commenting on stuff without a clue. And you just got to let that roll over your shoulder. Uh, but, you know, of course, any type of negative comment affects me because people don't realize that I sacrificed 16 years of my life, family, friends, relationships, everything to build this company uh, while other people were enjoying dinners and parties and hanging out and building relationships and having girlfriends. I mean, I was so damn busy working that I had a focus and a plan. And that's what I wanted to do is make great quality cigars. And it wasn't easy. It was very difficult. At first, I was the outsider. I wasn't born into a cigar family. I wasn't of Cuban descent. Uh, I couldn't get the right tobaccos. People didn't trust. Oh, who's this guy? He's another Don Nobody. I mean, you had people that I started with in 1996, uh, probably two, 300 companies out of which I'm probably one of two maybe that lasted in the business. So. I did it with hard work, I did it with passion, I did it with ambition, and you know, and that's all I can say is, you know, I made a lot of sacrifices to get where we are and, and we're driven to make great quality cigars that are consistent. And that's my passion and that's all I care about. So uh, really, if people don't understand that and they don't get it, they need to get to know me better and that's all I can say. Well answered. <laughs> Yes, and thank you for that. You know, it, it, it's hard sometimes to bring up a question because, you know, we hear things out there, you know, with, uh, like you said, you know, Twitter, Facebook, blogs, you know, and, and some of it we know is just pure crap. And, you know, it, it's, I can, un, I could understand, you know, it, it has to sting, you know, a little bit if somebody says something until you find out if they know what they're talking about or not, then it's, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, and there's been often times, you know, uh, people have read stuff and brought it to attention in my office, and, and there are the haters out there, and sometimes it might be competitors, whoever it might be, but, you know, I really don't take it to heart. I mean, people that really know me, that understand the industry, as long as my peers out there give me the respect, which I think they do, and they understand the hard work that I'm putting into Washington to protect the industry. They understand how hard I'm working to make great quality cigars. The fact that we're making, you know, unique product. I mean, people aren't buying our cigars just because it's fun and because it's a fad. I mean, we built this from the ground up. I started in my garage with four employees, first with two, then four. And we built this up with just hard work and sweat and equity into the work. So it wasn't given to me. It wasn't something that we just came up with a great marketing plan and the cigars took off. I think the, the cigar market right now, the palates of the consumers are very sophisticated. They know when they get a good cigar. And I always tell people, they don't remember you by the hundred great cigars they smoked. They remember you by the one bad one that you gave them. And so our goal being a natural product is to eliminate the mistakes and make as many good consistent cigars as we can make. Yep. That's so very true, too. They always, everybody remembers the negative. They don't always forget the tons of positives that you had. But, uh, Rocky, let's take one more from the chat room. Uh, the U.S. market is always looking for new product. Do you find that to be the same in the international market? Um, not so much more in the international market. You know, the international market is about 10, 15 years behind the United States market. Remember, the, the European market, the international market, grew up smoking dry cured cigars. Dry cured cigars, which are the machine made cigars, are still the most popular there. I find that their palate is not as sophisticated as the American cigar market. The other thing that we find is when we do events in Europe, when you do an event, people will buy two cigars. When we do an event, people will buy three boxes here, you know, at least a box. So the, the mark, people smoke a lot more. I think the market in the United States is a lot more sophisticated. They understand good quality cigars. It's slowly changing in Europe, but it's going to be a process. And they're definitely ahead of us, maybe in music, but they're definitely behind us as far as cigars are concerned. So uh, there's no doubt that there's a lot more education. And there's a language barrier, too. So, you know, when I go to Europe to the Dortmund show, or when I travel in Switzerland and Germany and we're doing events, um, 
it's hard to get these retailers to really, you know, you have to have an interpreter to try to, but, but it's changing and now we're getting our message out and that market is slowly growing for us and people are understanding. Before it was all Cubans and Davidoff, Cubans and Davidoff, that's all they smoked there because they didn't know better because those companies did such a wonderful job marketing. So we were behind the curve. Now we're finally getting there to those countries, getting our message up, getting it out, getting the cigars to people, and they're smoking them, and they realize, wow, there is better product out there than the Cubans. There is different product than the Davidoff cigars, and they're getting that in the market. Now, right. twofold for you. Uh, first off, what's your best-selling cigar in the international market? And second, do you have any uh, cigars that are only for the international market and not the United States? Well, it's a very interesting question. Uh, first of all, let me tell you the following. The international market is very, very different. They don't like cigars that have any dark wrappers on them. They absolutely don't like Maduros. They like light wrappers because in their mind, based on their past history, if a cigar has got a dark wrapper, they assume it's Brazilian or a Brazilian Maduro or Brazilian tobacco. So they're very closed off and this is slowly changing, but it's going to take time. So they don't like any kind of dark wrappers on their cigars. The second thing is they like very small ring gauges. They prefer Coronas, Petit Coronas and Robustos. A 6x60 would never sell in Europe. They would, even the Toros they find are too big. The third point is they don't smoke any box press cigars. They don't like box press, they're not used to box press, they don't get box press. So we actually make a whole different type of cigar for the European market. So when we sell them the vintages, I've got to make the vintages round instead of box press. I've got to make smaller ring gauges. And, and we don't sell any of our lines with darker wrappers. We take the lightest of the lightest wrappers in that particular blend and sell the lighter wrapper. So I've got to make special cigars for the European market. Now England is different, but Germany and Switzerland and a lot of the other countries, you know, they want a whole different type of cigar, which is what we make for those markets. Wow. That's interesting to hear. I, I knew about the uh, small ring gauges that they didn't care for or care for anything real big. But I, I didn't realize, you know, with the color and everything else, that's that's interesting to, to know. Yeah. That's, well, it's about that time. You want to ask Rocky the ultimate chat room question that we ask all our viewers? Yes. All right, Rocky. Here we go. Here's the finale. This is a question that came up in our chat room a while ago, and everybody wants us to keep asking this. All right. You, sir, are on your deathbed. What is your last cigar? The Rocky Patel 50. Wow. That was too easy. It's been like the whole show. It's just too easy. Everybody else always sits there and debates. Is there a certain ring gauge? Uh, yeah, I would go with the Toro. Six and a half or 52. Make it last a little longer, right? Yeah. There you go. Well, Rocky, listen, we want to thank you so much. I know you had plans. You have plans to go, and you stayed longer with us, and we really greatly appreciate it. Uh, anything we missed that you want to give a shout-out or say anything to before you go? Well, all I want to say is I thank you all for having me on, and it's great that you are out there promoting the entire cigar industry and, you know, uh, a, a site like yours and a show like yours is great for the industry, very healthy for the industry. Keep up the good work, and um, hopefully we get a chance to spend some time together. And to all of you that are following, spread the word, enjoy the show, because this is the kind of information that we need to get out to show that we need to unite. But most importantly, please ask your fellow peers to join Cigar Rights of America, cigarrights.org, because that's the only way we're going to save our industry and have the freedom and privilege because you have the American Lung Society, the American Cancer Society, tobacco-free kids, and many other groups who have nothing better to do but actually destroy our industry because they don't understand it and they don't get it. And it's a form of education to get them to back off. And this is something that we're going to have to live with the rest of our life to fight to protect our privileges. So as Americans, we see soldiers come back in body bags, missing limbs, and they go out to Iraq and Afghanistan to protect our freedoms. And hence, we should have the freedom and the right to be able to enjoy cigars. So fight for it because your neighbor's not going to do it. 100% correct. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Rocky. We do appreciate it. Thanks for taking the time out. We wish you nothing but well and hope to have you back on again someday soon. Thanks, Mike and Mike. Great seeing you and enjoy the weekend. See ya. See ya, Rocky. Thanks. See you later, Rocky. Thanks. Yeah,
All right, so right now you're seeing me all by my uh, lonesome, and soon you will see Mikey. I Just because I am actually doing the show right now, uh, Mike's on vacation. I'm producing it and trying to make everything happen, and it doesn't seem to always happen so easy. So let me get Mikey back here and uh, let him talk. All right, Mikey, you're back live, buddy. Hey, everybody, I'm live. <laughs> well, been drinking. There you I don't go. know. Did everybody see? So, so, so. I'll tell you, this producing the show and doing the Skype and doing all this, I have no time to pay attention to the chat room. I screwed up Matt's question almost. I was gibbering, jabbering, for Christ's sakes. I'll tell you, no more. This is it. It goes back to you. I'm done with it. But anytime, anyway, I want to thank everybody in the chat room for taking time out on Thursday night. We, uh, it's our last Thursday night show unless something else comes up. We uh, we kind of got away from it. There's where Mikey's vacation. and, and um, But uh, I want to thank everybody in the chat room. I think it was a great show, one of our best shows. I think Rocky was very informative and uh, very heartfelt, and uh, I enjoyed it. What do you think, buddy? Oh, yeah. Uh, Rocky's a great person you know, to, to talk to. He's really into you know, like like he said, the the rights of Americans with cigar rights, uh, you know, with CRA, everything like that. And I have to say, you know, it, and it's sad, like you said about with cigars, people always remember the bad one, yep. you know, instead of the 50 good ones or whatever. I remember, uh, I think it was the first cigar expo I went to up at Famous Smoke. Uh, Rocky got up on stage and was talking about, you know, with CRA and things. And everybody was just blah, 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 blah. You know, in the background, just almost drowning him out up there at the at the microphone, like it didn't matter. Right. And you know that that bothered me. I, I to this day, I guess I I restrain myself because of my first one. But I would love to get up and just holler at everybody. You know, shut the hell up and listen. Right. Because this is something. You know, and and people. You know, that was what uh, two years ago, three years ago yeah. when that happened. And look at all that's happened since. Yeah, so, no. you know, I, I have to say, you know, Rocky is he's doing so much for the industry. And uh, I, I just think it's it's great that he keeps it up. No, I totally agree with you, Mike. You know, you got a lot. You got to remember one thing, buddy. I mean, you know, it, reviewing cigars, there's a lot of people out there with egos, a lot of people who, you know, just don't want to hear the truth. They want to believe that th what they know is right, and that's what it is. And that's just society. It's the way it is. But anyways, all right, well, that's pretty much it. So, uh, Matt, I did remember that. I will make sure I clip that right. And uh, <laughs> Matt reminded me not to screw up. But until the next time, folks, uh, we appreciate everybody. And uh, as always, continue to support us because without your support, the shit really doesn't matter. So that's it. We'll see you soon.